All right. Well, um, what I would like us to do this morning, and um, uh, before we get started here, or as we get started here, and hopefully I put a new battery in my, I put a new battery in my clicker this there, whoops. <laughs> there it is. Maybe, it, I, I told Steve, I think maybe it's operator error is the problem with this clicker. But let's all stand this morning, if you will. And uh, this is the Lord's Prayer. We know this. But I would just love it if we would just say this together. And it's Matthew 6, 9 through 13. It says, In this manner, therefore, pray. And pray with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day your daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. Thank you. You can be seated. I love this prayer. And one thing I really like about this prayer is that it's, it's simple. The simplicity of this prayer. It, it, it starts out, it honors God. And then it asks for provisions. Asks for forgiveness. It guards us from temptations. I mean, isn't that um, basically what most of our prayers are about anyway? And um, it's so good. How many times have we said this prayer... And after we honor God, after we address God, and after we call Him holy, we say, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do we really understand what this means? What, God, what is your kingdom on earth? What is this? I, I, I think quite often we pray, we pray to God, we give Him honor, we give, we give Him glory, and we do ask for provisions for things that we encounter in this world. We do ask for forgiveness. We do ask for help with things that we struggle with, temptations. But, but do we really in our everyday prayers, do we really pray that your kingdom come, your will be done? Is that an important thing or do we really think about it that much? Now, now, some of us may say, okay, well, now it's easy to understand what, what your kingdom come is all about. If you've attended church very long, you, you understand that, that uh, when you're saved, you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, by His saving grace, and you're raised into His kingdom. So you're one of His children, so therefore you're living in His kingdom. Well, today, I just want to look at that a little closer and to see if that's true. Our we living in God's kingdom? Or are we living in our own kingdom? Jesus did a lot of teaching on this. He did a lot of teaching on this. What, how many times can you remember reading the Gospels that Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like? The kingdom of God is like? A lot of times. A lot of times. Well, why did he do so much teaching on that? Matthew 7 Matthew 7, we find teaching that Jesus did on this. He talked about what the gates. As a matter of fact, he talked about two kingdoms. The, 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 the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man or the kingdom of the world. I call it the kingdom of man. What they look like. He said, he said the kingdom of man, the gate is wide. It's wide open and the path is wide. It's easy to walk up there. It is a popular gate. It's just easy to go into the kingdom of man. But, he says that the kingdom of God, the gate, is very narrow. The very narrow, the road is difficult to walk. And he says that few, few enter the gate. Now, there's always those trying to enter into the narrow gate that doesn't belong. And Jesus says that, that you can recognize these by their actions. And we see that. <laughs> we, see that. we see that in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, 
shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name? Have I, have I not cast out uh, demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Then Jesus continues to explain what these two kingdoms look like. He said that, he said that the kingdom of, of God is like a man who hears my words... And he does them. He acts upon my words. He's like a man who builds his house upon the rock. And then whenever the rains come down and the floods come up and the rains come down and the floods come up, you know, we, we, we teach our kids that. And whenever the winds blow and whenever the troubles of life hits, the, the house stands. But then he said, you know, the kingdom of man, the kingdom of man is like the one who built his house on the sand. And when the testing of life comes, what happens to the house? It falls. It falls flat. Now, I want us to think about this a minute. We're talking about these two kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. And he has described them, Jesus has described them as two houses. Now, let's think about those two houses for a minute. Before they fall. What do those two houses look like before they fall? I've always got to get these mental pictures. I just, I, I, what, I, what I look at, what I think about, is I think about, you know how these subdivisions, where you, you, you drive down subdivisions and they have like these, these laws and uh, rules and stuff that, you know, the houses got to look pretty much alike. They got to have the same color siding and the same color shingles. And, you know, they all, they all look kind of pretty much alike. And I, I think about one here that looks just like the one here. Except this one has got a foundation of rock. And this one has a foundation of sand. But when you look at them, but when you look at them, they look really the same. You see, I think a lot of times whenever we, we study that, 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 that parable that Jesus said about the house on the rock and the house on the sand, we think, man, the lines are really defined. You can tell. You can tell that the people on the rock, the people has got their house on the rock. They're the Christian folks who's living their life right and they're following the word. And the people who, who have their house on the sand, well, they're the ones that's lost out there in sin and they're doing all that sinful stuff. And you can really tell it. The lines are very defined. Well, are they? Are the lines defined? Can we really tell the difference? In many ways. I mean, what did Jesus say in Matthew 7, 21? He said, there's going to be a lot of folks on that day that's going to say, Lord, Lord, I know you. Man, I casted out demons in your name. I, I did all kind of wonders in your name. Man, he's got, these guys got houses that look alike. They got lives that look alike. But what's Jesus going to say on that day? I don't know you. How defined are the lines and the people that live, the people that choose to live in the kingdom of God and the people that choose to live in the kingdom of man? Now, we can find the difference in the kingdom that follows Jesus and the kingdom that follows what Jesus taught and the kingdom that is self-taught. I think Jesus makes it clear that these two kingdoms are very opposite. Those that are first in the kingdom of man will be last in the kingdom of God and those who are first in the kingdom of God will be last in the kingdom of man. Jesus said that whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever is willing to lay down his life for my sake will find it. And that's, oh, that works so good. And that's number one in our, in our sermon notes, in our bulletins. If you don't have one, there's bulletins back there. Jesus said that whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever is willing to lay down his life for my sake 
will find it. <laughs> that will, um, what will it benefit a man if he gains success in this world and he loses his salvation? And what in man's world is worth a man's soul? You see, you've heard it said, to love your neighbor and to hate your enemy. I tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's what the king, that's what living in the kingdom of God looks like. To love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The house on the rock and the house in the sand. And I could go on and on about, about the many opposites found in the two kingdoms. Even those that were walking with Jesus Christ and had been raised under, the, the, under God's law struggled with these two kingdoms. Exodus, Exodus 21, 24 instructs that it is right to take an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. The kingdom of man tells us that, that this, is, this is proper. This is a proper way to take punishment or revenge, whichever you want to look at it. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. However, God's kingdom, God's kingdom set up the law in this way that, that punishment would not exceed an eye for an eye. It would not exceed a life for a life. That's why it was set up in this way. But then we, we look at Matthew 5, uh, 39 and we find Jesus teaching. And he says, he says, instead of taking an eye for an eye, instead of taking a life for a life, what does Jesus teach? Jesus says, turn the other cheek. That's what life looks like in God's kingdom. So which one, which one do we live in? Which house do we live in that we choose to live in? Peter approached Jesus and he said, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. It for, he said, you know, um, to forgive someone seven times is right. It's righteous to forgive someone seven times. And what did Jesus say? We know this. What did Jesus say? He said, you forgive them 70 times 7. You forgive them 70 times 7. And that's impossible to do in man's kingdom. However, as a member of God's kingdom, you understand that it's not about how many times. Righteousness is not about how many times you forgive somebody. What if you did forgive somebody seven times and then they did something wrong to you on the eighth time? What happens you harbor bitterness. You harbor hatred in your heart then. And when you're living in God's kingdom, you understand that limitless forgiveness is about preventing yourself to harbor uh, terrible feelings, harbor hatred, harbor bitterness. It keeps you from doing that. Unlimited forgiveness, that's what it's all about. That's what it means to live in God's kingdom. And number two... It's Steve. <laughs> Click it, Steve. There it is. Nah, I don't know what's going on. Um, forgiving others is ultimately about preventing ourselves from being imprisoned by hatred and bitterness. That's what it's about. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of man are opposite of each other. All of us desire... Come on now. All of us desire to be in God's kingdom. Why is that? Why do we desire to be in God's kingdom? Because that's the folks that gets to go to heaven. And we want to be the people that get to go to heaven. But do we choose to live in His kingdom? Are we willing to let others be first? Are we willing to be that servant are we willing to have forgiveness with no limits? And to pray for our enemies. And to bless. And to not curse. 
That's what it like. That's what it's like to live in the house. His foundation is on the rock. Are we living there or not? Matthew. Oh, Lord. Matthew 13, 44 through 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like hidden treasure. <clears throat> treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. Let me explain. Remember the story of, of the young rich ruler? Remember him? He approached Jesus and he asked, he said, What can I do to inherit eternal life? What can I have, do to have eternal life? And I know that often this story is looked at as one, as a lesson of, of someone who is trusting in their own possessions over trusting in God. And yeah, I think that's true. I think that's true. But I think there's so much more to it than that. We see in Matthew 19, 17 through 20. And this is just after, just after um, the young man asked Jesus this question. So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but the one that no one, I can't read. No one is good, but one that is God. But if you want to enter into the kingdom, <laughs> what is going on today? If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, Jesus said, keep my commandments. Now, you know how many commandments there were? There was many commandments. So the young ruler said, well, which ones? Which ones should I keep? So Jesus picked out a few. He said, he said, you should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And you shall love your neighbors yourself. And can't you just see the young man? He was like, check, check. Check, check, got it, got it. I've got it, I've done all them. All these things I have kept from my youth. Now what do I lack? And Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. Come what? Come be part of the kingdom. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, we need to be real careful right here. We need to be careful here in saying that what kept the young man from in inheriting eternal life was the love for his possessions. And the reason why is this. If his problem was his love for his possessions, and that kept him from having eternal life, then all that we have to do is sell our wealth and give it away, and we got it. Right? Isn't that how it works? Isn't that what, you, what it's teaching us? All of us have some kind of wealth, so if we just go sell our wealth and give it to the poor, then we're in. I don't think the plan of salvation works. Charity... Um, works through charity. I don't think the plan of salvation works that way. To begin with, yes, we must love God and we must keep His commandments. But grace, grace received through faith is the only way that we are saved. But however, we are called to repent from our old life, from our old self. Or maybe we could say from our old kingdom. We are to become, when, 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 when we become new, when we follow Jesus Christ, when we know Him as our Savior, we become new. We are a new person. We are a new creation. We are born again. We could say a new kingdom. 
The word repent doesn't just mean to turn in the opposite direction. Yes, <laughs> yes, it it um, it means that you're you're living life going this way, and you repent of that life. You're sorrowful now of that life, so you turn and go the opposite direction. Yes, it does mean that, but there's more to it than that. We turn from our old kingdom. We turn from our old way. It means then that we have to walk in a newness of life. Once you turn and go the other direction, you have to do something. And you have to walk in your newness of life. You have to become that new person. Take every thought captive to obey Christ. Not to be conformed anymore by the old kingdom, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind into the new kingdom. Jesus was telling the rich young ruler to repent of your old way of living, to wipe the slate clean and enter in to a new life. <sighs> wipe it away. When he was telling him to sell that stuff, it wasn't just get, get, get rid of those possessions. He was saying, what you got to do is wipe it all away. Your old way of life, your old way of living, your old kingdom, you've got to get rid of it. And only then, only then can you come and follow me. The problem is this, and it's what I said before. We want to be God's people but we don't want to live in a kingdom. And that's number four. We want to be God's people, but we don't want to live in the kingdom. Guys, you can come up. It really comes down to this, guys. How much value do you place on your relationship with Jesus Christ? It really comes down to that. How much value do you place on your relationship with Jesus Christ? I haven't forgot about, I told you I said I would explain about the treasure in the field and about the pearl. Do we really look at our salvation and our relationship with Jesus Christ as that treasure in the field? You find that treasure in the field and you'll sell everything, you'll do anything that you can to possess that treasure. Or, 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 you're, or you're like that merchant that finds that pearl. And you're willing to turn your lives completely upside down just to be able to have that pearl. That's what it's like to live in the house with rock underneath it. That's what it's like. How bad do we really want it? You see... I didn't have time this week, but I really wanted to bring a table up here and, and put some yard sale stuff on it and put a couple yard sale signs up and call it the Rich Young Rulers Yard Sale. Because when it comes right down to it, this is what we're talking about. What do we, what do we get rid of in a yard sale? What do we put in a yard sale? <laughs> that's right we put in the yard sale the stuff that we don't want anymore because what do we usually do when the yard sale is over what do we usually say whatever's left we're going to pack it up take it to the mission you don't want it anymore well what God has called us to do whenever we accept Jesus Christ as our savior he's not telling us to have a yard sale he's telling us to have an all in auction he's telling us to sell it all He's telling us if you're going to move, if you're going to move from that house on the sand to the house in the rock, you've got that you can't, can't, all that stuff's contaminated. You can't bring anything to the house on the rock. You've got to get rid of it all. You've got to have an all in auction. Do we sell stuff that we still want to keep in an all in auction? Sure, we do. But there's usually a greater reason for it. We have to move or, or, or there's an illness or, or there's something like that. So we just have to sell everything. We, see, we get rid of stuff that we don't want, but we have to. And God is calling us to have the all-in auction, not just some yard sale. 
You ever walk around and say, yeah, well, you know, since Christ saved me, I don't drink or smoke or do anything like that anymore. He's delivered me. Well, did you do it before or did you even want to do it now? That's just yard sale stuff. How about the stuff that you really desire? How about the stuff that we're really holding on to? Sell it. Sell it all. Don't shake your head. Don't shake your head at that rich young ruler and say, Oh, I can't believe him. He wouldn't, he wouldn't sell his stuff to follow Christ. Are you willing? Are you willing? And, and most of the time, it's not possessions that I'm talking about. It's not possessions. It's not money. Sometimes it is. But there's a lot of other things that we desire in life that we're not willing to walk and to live in the kingdom of God. We want God, but we're not willing to walk and live there. We're not willing to move into the house on the rock. Because we still think like the people that live on the house in the sand. Are we willing to let others be first? Are we willing to be the servant? Are we willing to, when we say, are, are we willing to have unlimited forgiveness? Man, that doesn't filter through our, our fairness filter very well, does it? That doesn't filter through at all. Are we willing to let go of grudges? Are we willing to let go of, of, of pain and scars? Are we willing to let go of those things? Because the people in the, live in the house with the rock under it, they've been freed from those things. They let it all go in the auction. Are we Christians that just want to do yard sale stuff? Or are we Christians going to sell it all? The rich young ruler, he just wanted to have a yard sale. What are we willing to get rid of today? Whose kingdom are we really willing to live in? Our lives will show it. Our lives will show it. So think about that this morning as these guys play. And you're always welcome to come.